Two young girls are murdered and the father of one of them is blamed. Despite a lack of evidence and many implausible theories, he is convicted on a coerced confession. He would spend over five years in prison until DNA leads investigators to a violent man that went on to kill again. This is the case of Jerry Hobbs. Hello, true crime fanatics. I'm Hallie. And I'm Brittany. And thank you for jumping into the abyss with us today. We're glad that you are here and that you're joining us. If you are listening to us on YouTube, go ahead and hit that red subscribe button and turn on your notifications so that way you get told every time there's a new episode up. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, go ahead and give us that five star rating. You can share us to your social media platforms. Also, go and follow us there. We post a bunch of updates on cases or different stuff maybe we don't talk about on the episode. So we would love for you guys to go and join us there. Also, throughout the episodes, you can find show notes and pictures from the cases. Also, all of our sources on theabysspod.com. Also, we have a Patreon that you can go and be a part of. You can do like $3 a month or more if you'd like. Right now, it's just kind of a donation thing, but we hope to be able to get more tiers going on and be able to give you guys some really cool gifts and extra content. Also, in case you missed the book club episode, our book for February that we'll be discussing is The Hunting Party by Lucy Foley. So go ahead, get that book, start reading it. It's going to be a really good one. Brittany and I have both already dived into it. And we think you guys are going to like it. So I guess it is time to jump in to the abyss with us. So let's go. Jerry Brayton Hobbs III lived in Zion, Illinois with his partner, Sheila. The couple had three children together, Jerry Jr., age 10, Laura, age 8, and Jeremy, age 6. Sheila also had a daughter named Megan, age 13, from a previous relationship. Jerry had a criminal history dating back to at least the 90s. It was mostly petty stuff like marijuana possession, but it did include a couple of aggravated assaults. Jerry had moved to Scion after completing an 18-month sentence for an aggravated assault. The incident involved an argument with a neighbor, during which time Jerry brought out a chainsaw. He was released April 12, 2005 and began living with Sheila and her parents and their children, something that Sheila's parents were not super happy about. Less than a month after returning home, it was Mother's Day, May 8, 2005, Laura went outside to play with her friend Crystal. Laura knew the rule was to be back by dark, but when the sun set and there was no sign of Laura, her family became super worried. They set out to find her and found that Crystal was also missing. Jerry and other friends and family searched through the night and into the next day. And that next day, May 9th, is when Jerry decided to search nearby Beulah Park. He found one of the girls' bicycles, and after that, that area was really zeroed in on to search. It was not long before the bodies of Laura and Crystal were found. They were both lying face up a few feet from one another. Police thought the poses may have even been staged. The girls' shoes were placed neatly beside them. Laura had been stabbed 20 times, including stab wounds through both of her eyes, and Crystal had been stabbed 11 times. Laura had also been sexually assaulted, but this fact would not be known for another four years. The Lake County Major Crimes Task Force jumped on the investigation. Unfortunately, this is the same group involved with other cases that have been mishandled. As their first course of action after the bodies were found, they took Jerry in for interrogation and put him into a small room with no window or clock, so his perception of time was non-existent. Jerry was never told that he was being detained, and over the following 24 hours, they interrogated him 10 times. He was so exhausted that he tried to take naps on the floor in between questioning. Note to everyone out there, Brittany always reminds me that if you ever get taken in, you should only ever say, am I being detained? And if they say no, then you can leave. And if they say yes, then you say you need to speak to your lawyer. And that's it. In fact, Jerry asked for a lawyer multiple times, but they declined to provide him with one, which is very illegal. There were four primary investigators involved in the questioning, and they were Sheltz, Harris, Jones, and Capaluti. Capaluti? We're going to go with Capaluti. <laughs> Allegedly, the officers then went into a small room and asked Jerry to sign a form that just confirmed that the police were allowed to ask him questions. 
However, it was actually a Miranda waiver. His rights were not read to him, and he trusted the police enough to believe that it wasn't important to read the document before signing it. Never good. Never sign your name on anything without reading it. Ever. In any circumstance. (laughs) Throughout the interrogation, the investigators assumed that Jerry Hobbs got angry, lost his temper, and killed the two girls, primarily based on the idea that he found the bodies. They even recalled all of the gruesome details to Jerry and forced him to look at the pictures of the crime scene. Which, remember, this included his daughter. When he made an effort to look away, one of the officers grabbed him and threw him on the floor. Officers supposedly made inappropriate comments about the murders. They really just made Jerry feel hopeless by telling him that they had physical evidence against him, that his alibi was invalid, and that they had an eyewitness. Later on, the police told Jerry that they had a voice stress analysis test that would be able to determine if he was lying, which doesn't truly have an accurate way to determine if someone's lying. Kind of like a polygraph, but this is even less accurate than a polygraph. However, they still made him complete the test four different times, then said he failed it. Which, just a little side note, if it really did work, then why did they make him take it four times? Unless they just wanted him to keep doing it, that way they could assume it was deception. In general, they really made Jerry uncomfortable and interrogated him inappropriately and illegally. They told Jerry that he should charge for their guns so that they would be justified in killing him, and they would manipulate him by praying with him and then lying and intimidating him. When they still couldn't get the confession, they transferred Jerry to a room with a camera and told him that there was a special test that would find evidence on him. They found a small mark on his pants, which Jerry pointed out was from him wiping his nose and then wiping his pants when he was crying as the officers prayed with him. They made him strip off his clothes anyway and put on a paper suit so they could take his clothing to find more evidence. They also told him that the light test had revealed all the evidence they needed to convict him. They further manipulated him by telling him that his family did not care about him, they had not asked about how he was doing, and none of them wanted anything to do with him. Police told him that his family knew that he had done it and he should just confess Jerry was also told that there was an officer outside the door that was especially enraged about what he had done to Laura and Crystal, and if Jerry did not give them what they wanted, that this officer would come in and basically attack Jerry. When Jerry still refused to make this confession, the officer, Officer Jones, was sent in. He was very large. His only purpose of being there was basically to intimidate Jerry into doing what they wanted him to. But still, Jerry would not confess to this thing he said that he hadn't done so jones made good on the promise of violence and punched jerry slammed him into a wall he even threatened to kill jerry and tell everyone that he went for jones gun according to the court documents all of this conduct of the officers was approved by officer valco jerry was commanded to confess yet again and he told them that they obviously weren't interested in the truth Officers then told Jerry to just lie and tell them what they wanted to hear. Remember, at this point, Jerry had faced a huge trauma in discovering the bodies of his daughter and his daughter's friend, and he had been interrogated for 24 hours. He had been beaten, lied to, and made to stay awake for nearly 48 hours, and he was being psychologically tortured, basically, and still maintained his innocence. Finally, Jerry raised his white flag because he knew that he had no other choice. Lying or not, they just wanted him to say that he did it. He told the investigators that he would confess to doing it, but he needed to go to a judge. Jerry believed that talking to a judge would shine some light on the situation and help prove his innocence. Also, that the judge would not believe the false confession. Jerry made sure to give a confession that was irrational and implausible, so that way it could be nothing more than laughed at, even including that Crystal attacked him with a potato peeler. Jones came back and told Jerry to put all of his confession down on paper. But he refused because he wanted to speak to a judge. He was very adamant about that. They then said that they would type it, but he refused to sign that as well. They asked him to write an apology letter to Crystal's family, but he also refused to do that because he wasn't the one who killed her. Officer Schultz then wrote up a statement himself and intimidated Jerry with violence if he did not sign it. So he eventually complied. After that, they made Jerry put on a jail uniform and they took him back to the crime scene to show them where the knife was in Beulah Park. He told them that there was no knife for him to point out because he didn't murder the girls. This just frustrated Officer Jones even more, so he ended up assaulting Jerry Hobbs once again. 
On May 10th at 8.40 a.m., prosecutors met with the officers involved in the interrogation to review the information that they had. The officers said that they had no notes, no audio or video of the confession, which obviously seems pretty convenient. And we've talked about this before, Brittany. I think that there should be no pre-interview to like a recorded interview. Yeah, what's the point of recording an interview if they're just like, oh, we'll just do a pre-interview and then we'll we'll do the actual recorded interview once we have everything like set the way that we want it. That shouldn't be at all. <laughs> no. And I know that kind of doesn't go with this because they're saying they don't have any, but it just made me think about that because we yeah. talk about that a lot where it's like... And that's what happened in Adnan's case where there would be pre-interviews with, with Jay and then all of a sudden his story would change in the next one, you know, and... There's no such thing as a pre-interview. It's either an interview or it's not an interview. Exactly. Like, and it should all be recorded. Everything should be recorded. I feel like every room in a police station should have cameras on it 100% of the time, you know? <laughs> yeah. Nothing should be by word of mouth, especially not these days with yeah. all the corruption that happens and all of the, you know, dirty cops or things mm-hmm. like that. You really should have everything recorded. That's why we got the body cams on police officers. Yeah. And even those, they're like, oh, I haven't turned it on yet. That shouldn't even be an option. Oh, I hit it and I accidentally <laughs> yeah, turned it off. Whoopsie. <laughs> like, there should be no room for doubt. And they should want that. If they were going to be doing their job correctly, they should want that. And, and like, further than that, if they happen to not turn on their camera during a very eventful moment, they should be penalized severely yeah. because that is someone's life at stake. It should be thrown out completely. Like, nothing that hasn't been recorded should be used which was the problem they ran in here because he confessed and it wasn't on video at all and the prosecutors were like well (laughs) but even then the trauma's already been sustained by jerry you know yeah and in that case in adnan's case they already managed the situation how they wanted it you know in the quote-unquote pre-interview and then the actual interview doesn't even matter because it's just all lies (laughs) so definitely a lot of changes should be made there and they should want that they should want every confession to be videotaped so they can see see we didn't coerce him we didn't beat him up we didn't do any of this stuff they should want that or so that way they could even say even if it was like a wrongful situation they could go back and be like this is why we believed yeah that he did it rather than just being like oh well he just we just oh, think so whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. It's infuriating, especially in these cases where we keep coming back the same county in Illinois and the same people involved and the same kind of thing. And yeah, if you listen to our episode for the book club this month where we talked about the 19th Christmas, there was like a wrongful conviction thing we talked about in there. And we mentioned that it's the same thing with every single one. Yeah. There's always someone who's wrongfully convicted. There's always DNA that doesn't want to get checked out. There's always like abuse from the police or manipulation. There's always these long ongoing um, interrogation processes. It's always the exact same thing. And they always have to go to multiple trials to even get acquitted if it is even that. Yeah, it takes so long. It takes years, sometimes decades of these people's lives for the truth to actually be uncovered. And even that case, that was another case in Illinois and Chicago. So Chicago, get it together. Yeah, honestly, (laughs) get it together. So like I said, the prosecutors knew that they needed this confession on video so they could have an easier time claiming that it was not coerced. They started coaching the officers on how to draw out a confession that seemed authentic, which... Again, very shady. (laughs) They decided to basically underhandedly threaten Jerry that they would arrest and charge Sheila if he didn't confess. So it wasn't like a physical threat, but it was, you know, a threat to the mother of his children and his partner. They again set Jerry in an interrogation room with a video camera and told him to confess on tape. He refused again and was assaulted. They then told him that Sheila was there at the station and they were intending to charge her which would leave their children parentless. He finally relented, but even on the first recording, he said the entire confession was a lie. So the officers erased that tape and had to start over. Which I love that. He said, okay, I'll record. Just so you know, this is all a lie. Okay, let's go. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly. In the next attempt at recording he read the confession that had been typed but still maintained it was a lie officers told him he would undoubtedly receive the death penalty and he just needed to basically play along prosecutors saw this entire thing play out and said nothing about it 
But eventually they got enough on tape, I guess, that they were satisfied. And at 4.30 p.m. that day, Jerry was finally arrested and read his Miranda rights. Officers got to work prepping false reports and destroying incriminating notes from the interrogation that made them look bad. Later, a jail guard would even come forward saying that he overheard one of the officers talking to Jerry. And in this conversation, Jerry said that he did not kill the girls and had no idea where the murder weapon was. The guard then heard the officer tell Jerry to just lie. And apparently they wore him down to the point where they got enough. Jerry was charged with the double murder and had a bond hearing for May 11th. He was denied bail because of the confession. And bear in mind, there's no evidence at this point of any kind linking Jerry to the murder other than that confession. There's no forensics, nothing. While in jail, Jerry was kept in total isolation. This was said to be done because his case was so high profile. They didn't want him to talk to other inmates. He was also denied access to the law library and legal materials on his case. Due to being denied bail, he was also not allowed to attend his daughter's funeral. The officers came up with an entire confession and said that this is what Jerry confessed to. They said that Jerry was frustrated that day because Sheila let Laura go outside and play when she was supposed to be grounded for stealing $40 from her mother. They said that Jerry went to the park to chat with Laura and then he ordered her home. When she refused, he knocked her out and Crystal supposedly pulled out a knife for defense. Two little tidbits of information to know, Crystal was only nine years old, so why on God's green earth would she be carrying a knife in a a park for children? Not to mention that Crystal's parents agreed that it was absurd to believe that their daughter was carrying a knife. Also, some articles said that it was a potato knife or a small knife, so we are unsure if maybe it got twisted from the potato peeler that Jerry had in his ludicrous confession or what. Anyways, they said that Jerry then got the knife from Crystal and stabbed both the girls, including Laura being stabbed in both of her eyes. They said that he then proceeded to hide the bodies and covered in blood, he went home to clean himself. Surprisingly, he was an expert cleaner because they were unable to find even one speck of blood or any remnants of the crime happening. They reported that he used alcohol to clean up the blood, but this would not do the job accurately, and they would have easily been able to find some of the blood that would be left behind. Another aspect that doesn't line up with the story is the position of the bodies. They said the bodies were strategically positioned, but if he was hiding them in a panic after a blind rage, then would he take the time to really position them in this manner, like they said? In August of 2006, a motion to suppress the confession was filed. Officers Schletz, Harris, and Capaluti all testified that the confession was 100% voluntary, of course. Jerry, still fearful of physical violence, did not testify on his own behalf. Prosecutors also tried to intimidate Jerry's lawyer, Keith Grant. And who would do such a thing? Well, if you listen to our episode on Juan Rivera, this name might ring a bell. It was none other than state's attorney. m m m m m m m And that's not the last we'll hear of Marmel in this case. Swaps from the autopsies for the two girls came into question again as well. The DNA crime lab actually runs under the authority of the Lake County State's Attorney's Office, which seems like a bit of a conflict of interest if you ask me, but no one did. So the State's Attorney's Office tells the lab which tests are allowed and which are not. Jerry's legal team really pushed to get these swabs tested independently, and prosecutors came up with a truly asinine excuse that this couldn't happen because they would have to shut the entire lab down to run the test to avoid confidentiality concerns and contamination. I don't know how that makes sense at all unless all tests run under normal procedure are questionable or they only run one test at a time in the whole lab, which is obviously absurd. So why was this necessary? Who knows? The lab was also instructed to not be in communication with Jerry's legal team. And the swabs had not been tested for DNA thus far at all. Jerry's defense team examined all of the evidence thoroughly. They say there were injuries left behind on the girls that suggested they had been beaten with something that left round bruises. They also thought the murders looked kind of, quote unquote, ritualistic, especially with the stab wounds through both of Laura's eyes. The bodies appeared to have been undressed and then redressed and then posed. 
The knife used was never found, and the only DNA test that had been run was on samples found under the girl's fingernails, which had come back not matching Jerry. So it kind of seems like they may have found that out and then declined to do more testing because it wouldn't show them what they wanted to hear. None of the evidence pointed back to an unplanned attack in the heat of the moment, and none of it pointed to Jerry. Jerry's team finally got a motion passed that allowed the vaginal, oral, and rectal swabs to be tested by the Serological Research Institute. On August 7, 2007, the report was released, and it was found that there was spermatozoa and semen on all of the swabs taken from Laura. This confirmed that Laura was sexually assaulted, a fact that had not been determined before. Jerry was excluded as being a contributor of any of these samples, and not only that, but all of the samples came from a single, yet unidentified male. On November 12th, 2008, Jerry's legal team motioned for a review of his bond since the DNA excluded him from the crime scene. This was very troubling to the defense team because they wanted to keep him behind bars. Regardless, a hearing occurred a little less than a month later on December 2nd. Good old Mermel deliberately lied multiple times throughout the hearing, which is not a first for him. Mermel said that the DNA just showed, quote, one errant sperm, end quote, which could not have been from the perpetrator. That statement alone makes absolutely zero sense. He also said that the biological material, quote, doesn't have the underlying P30 substrate that would be left with an offender leaving his sperm on her, end quote. This statement was purely fictitious. All the samples tested positive for P30, Mermel also told the Chicago Tribune that the sperm samples were not found in any place significant and that any sperm in or on her was purely from playing on the playground or something. This was yet another lie and highly unlikely. Finding a sperm of any kind on an eight-year-old is automatically significant. Furthermore, sperm was found via vaginal swabs. This is about as significant as it gets. And sperm does not just get inside a young girl from a playground. That is nonsensical. However, the conclusion was to deny the motion and kept Jerry behind bars for three more years. None of the officers ever admitted that the confession was false, and the blatantly false confession was the only evidence that they had against Jerry Hobbs. On June 24, 2010, the DNA profile that had been entered into the national database finally got a hit. It was definitively found to be from a man named... Jorge Torres. Things started falling into place pretty quickly after that. Jorge was a former resident of Zion, and not only that, but he had been a friend of Crystal's brother, so there was a connection. Jorge was in jail already, having been arrested in Virginia, and he would be convicted of a rape and an assault and the murder of Amanda Snell, who had been killed on July 13th, 2009. So once again, if these officers and prosecutors had cared about justice or actually solving the crime, they potentially could have saved a life and prevented unimaginable trauma. Jerry was finally released on August 3rd, 2010, after being held in prison for 1,912 days. Even after the release... Prosecutor Waller told media that he, quote, was not convinced that Hobbs didn't have a role in the killings, end quote, but he knew that the case couldn't be proven, so they decided not to pursue it any further. He also said that Jerry had taken them to where he, quote unquote, threw the murder weapon into the park. This really doesn't fit with any account of the events, even the lies made up by the police and the prosecutors. Waller, similarly to Mermel, also asserted that the DNA didn't mean anything because it could have come from before the murder. So he's saying that a known killer that had an association with the victims just so happened to rape Laura right before her father decided to murder her in a frenzy from which there was absolutely no evidence. Or was he saying that she just happened to come into contact with his biological matter on the playground and then coincidentally was murdered none of that makes any sense quite the coincidence <laughs> and like Hallie said according to Mermel Jorge just so happened to leave his biological material behind on the playground and somehow ended up in incriminating places but that's just so absurd that's just insane so I'm not sure what these two men have done on playgrounds but the chances of either of those things happening is just astronomical the mental gymnastics these people have to go through to come up with these theories is astounding they should go into creative writing not police work <laughs> yes <laughs> 
On December 1st, 2010, Jerry filled out a lawsuit that described everything that had been done to him with the help of Kathleen Zellner, which queen, we all love her. She slays at her job. I don't know anyone better. (laughs) If you don't know who she is, she handles a lot of wrongful conviction cases. That includes Stephen Avery's case as seen on Netflix in the Making a Murderer series. In the lawsuit, they discuss 16 counts, including coercing a confession, Miranda violations, conspiracy, failure to intervene, denial of access to courts, and defamation. Some of these were dismissed while others were allowed, and Jerry ended up receiving a $7.75 million settlement. On September 18, 2018, Jorge Torres received a plea deal after confessing to the murders of Crystal and Laura, and he was sentenced to 100 years in prison. He admitted to committing the heinous crime at at age 16 and since he was not caught he went on to abduct three women and sexually assault them in february 2010 one specifically he strangled raped and sodomized and left for dead but she survived he was arrested again later on a drug charge and engaged in a car chase after murdering the girls jorge joined the marines and it was there that he met amanda snell she was a navy petty officer and resided in the same barracks as him After her murder, investigators think there may have been more bodies in Jorge's past and are looking into open cases that may have been occurring in places that he was stationed, including Okinawa. Jerry had a hard time after all of this, and he was arrested for possession of meth and was sent to prison with a 10-year suspended sentence. If you remember from the Juan Rivera case, Marmol was forced to retire in December of 2011 under the direction of Waller. This was not really a win, more like bad people cleaning house. Waller was directly related to the coercion and abuse of Jerry Hobbs and others and he knew full well what was happening so I find it hard to believe that he drove Mermel out for any reason other than he made the whole office look bad. With so many wrongful convictions particularly in this one area with these specific people involved it's clearly an institutional problem. Mermel was forced out of his position for the comment he made that we covered in the Juan Rivera case about taxpayers not paying for intellectual curiosity but for convictions which oof. that combo got me heated this is just the cherry on top of a mountain of asinine statements and basically a whole career of being instrumental in the perversion of justice Waller really is no better as far as I'm concerned they have blood on their hands from every person murdered by killers allowed to run free while innocent people are railroaded and wrongly convicted In 2011, Jerry Hobbs and another man, Kevin Fox, who had also been wrongly convicted and had also been represented by Kathleen Zellner, joined together to call for the end of the death penalty. They said this system is far too flawed to be executing people. They also called for DNA testing in murder cases to be mandatory, which, yes. In 2014, Jerry's court case was settled, and that's when he received the seven. $7.75 $7.75 million payout. This was the largest pre-trial detainee settlement in the U.S. And also a fun little side note. In 2005, Nancy Grace went on her show and said she was so absolutely positive that Jerry Hobbs had killed his daughter that if police did not turn up any physical evidence, she would, quote, eat a dirt sandwich, end quote. So we're all still waiting on that one. We have to pick the nastiest dirt possible. <laughs> In Jerry's case, it was clear that he was sleep-deprived during the investigation and under immense stress. Sleep deprivation has been shown to increase suggestibility and lower a person's psychological defenses. Once you mix this with trauma, physical assault, manipulation, and intimidation, you have the absolute perfect recipe for a false confession, and the police know this. Jerry's defense team said there were three primary points that made the police target him. Number one was that he found the bodies. In reality, he found the bikes that led to the bodies, not specifically the bodies themselves. Number two was his criminal history. Jerry had an altercation with the man, and he had chased him with a chainsaw, but the man had brought a gun to the discussion as well, so don't know what they were talking about, but it was obviously a little heated, a little tense. (laughs) And even the neighbor involved in that was like, yeah, that's just kind of how it is. (laughs) Yeah, he was super nonchalant about the altercation when the police arrived. Number three was due to Jerry's relationship with the victim. Being a family member automatically puts someone under the police's radar. In conclusion, no one involved admitted that they did anything wrong or broke protocol, but thankfully Jerry Hobbs walks as a free man. Jerry Hobbs spent nearly 2,000 days in prison due to gross misconduct of a department that has been involved in many similar cases. How many more people will be put through this ordeal before the system is really examined and overhauled? 